Well, hello, everybody. Here we are. We're at the end of the day. Uh, I'm glad you came back after lunch and continuing these conversations. It's been a delightful uh, conversation. Uh, this is a group of thought leaders. This is a group representing the larger group of fellows that, that CCA has uh, sort of put together from across the country. And as we have an opportunity to represent sort of the fellows conversation, um, it's really our pleasure to provide sort of an overview of what we have been up to over the last year or so in terms of our thinking, our conversations, our questions, questions we would like to pose back to the Alliance um, as we continue the conversations around all sorts of things, right? From, from a workforce development uh, and college completion conversation to our student success work with the lens through equity, uh, through pathways related to returning adults, to pathways related to secondary bridging to post-secondary. And we're going to sort of go through each of those sort of large subjects in very round-robin sort of fashion today, kind of laser focusing on some very specific questions, again, to set the stage for the future of our related work as we go through this, this stuff together. So with that being said, uh, Teresa Lubbers from Indiana is here. Welcome, Teresa. Tim Rennett from Georgia. Tim. Of course, Elena from Massachusetts, and Herman from Georgia. All right, so let's kick this off with the conversation about workforce development and college completion. And we're going to start with, with Teresa, and, and then we'll follow with, with Rick. Um, talking about this idea between what is needed in our local industry, our local states, our local region, from a workforce perspective, and also carrying that torch for college completion simultaneously. Oftentimes, as is happening in states and regions nationally, folks will come back to school or start school, earn a few college credits, and potentially they might be work ready, but they did, they did not walk out of our institutions necessarily with a college credential. In the state of Indiana, how are you having these conversations uh, related to workforce development and college completion? Well, I think we're all having these conversations, but I hope that we can begin with an agreement that it isn't a competition between the two, but really it is about an alignment between workforce needs and, and college completion. Um, really, for the last two strategic plans that we've had in Indiana, we've had three guiding principles, and it was uh, to build a student-centered, mission-driven, workforce-aligned system of higher education. And there was, when, in 2012, when we included the Workforce Aligned, it was really at the beginning of these really robust discussions about workforce alignment. But we thought it was really very important to do that because we knew then what has become even more abundantly clear is that, um, that more than ever, the jobs were going to require some sort of education and training beyond high school. And so that's really required us to look even more uh, Seriously, when you look at post-recession, all 99% of the new jobs that have been created require some sort of quality credential beyond high school. And so what we've tried to do is to send the message that um, higher education is in a partnership with employers and state economies to actually do that. That we're looking for the right fit for students based on their personal aspirations and preparations as they can then align their credentials with uh, what employers need and the economy needs. And by doing that, at our state level or at the national level, really reinventing economies around job creation that really works in the 21st century. So we try to do this in an aligned way. We have a new governor's workforce cabinet that's very focused on doing this, as I know many other states do as well. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. How about, how about for Georgia, Tim? Well, I, I think the misnomer out there is that aligning our curricular efforts with workforce requires a retooling of the whole curriculum, requires you know, faculty starting from ground zero. You know, what we found at Georgia State is that a lot of the effort and uh, attention needs to be paid to just having students do a better job of recognizing as they progress through the curriculum what they are learning, the competencies they're picking up that are going to be valuable to employers, and documenting that. 
So uh, some of this dovetails very well with uh, some of the game changers uh, that Complete College America puts forth. Uh, we, for now seven, eight years, have been enrolling all students in the first semester in learning communities based upon meta-majors. So we've taken the pressure off having our mostly first-generation, low-income student body make a choice of major as they enter the institution. And we try to find a general area of interest. Are they interested in business or the arts or STEM? And then we do programming to support the choice that they're about to make. You know, if they're interested in business, then we put them in learning communities with other students interested in business, and we have a faculty member from business teach an orientation course. We do open houses in the departments in the business school, so the students can meet the faculty from marketing and finance and accounting and so forth. We do alumni panels. And then what we've done more recently is we provided all our incoming students at Georgia State as they matriculate with career-based e-portfolios. Mm. So these are uh, cloud-based uh, platforms where the students can document the learning they're doing in the classroom. And we set up categories in those portfolios like communication skills, analytic skills, leadership, and the students have a task of occupying uh, each of those categories with some kind of artifact. They can post videos, they can post audio files, and of course text files as well. And what we've seen is just from those relatively light touch changes, a significant change in student outcomes. When it comes to the portfolio, last year Georgia State students posted over 700,000 artifacts to their e-portfolios. So once you get them in the mindset of thinking about what they're picking up, what they're learning that's going to be of value uh, to their careers, they begin to document it. We've seen a huge reduction in students changing majors after the first year because we're helping them make a more informed decision in those those first couple uh, semesters. And in the Brookings rankings that came out last December, Georgia State ranked 25th out of over 2,000 institutions ranked when it came to social mobility, taking students from the last quintile and moving them uh, 15 years after graduation into the upper half. So that hasn't required us to retool the whole curriculum. It's required us to be much more intentional in getting students to think about the career-based learning they're already doing. That's terrific, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, the meta major approach. I'm glad you're sort of putting that on top of uh, a notion of purpose first, thinking about the end in mind at the beginning, uh, career exploration, those sorts of things. How are each of your states engaging in these kinds of conversations with industry stakeholders? Well, I think what we've tried to do is make sure that what students learn is aligned to what they are going to do and in actually having them be engaged through internships, apprenticeships. We have a new office of work-based learning and apprenticeship at the state of Indiana. Uh, so we say that as a rule rather than an exception, students should have an opportunity to be engaged in workplace learning while they're in school. And that you, this should not be sequential. You go to school and then you get a job, but that we should be blurring the lines for those two so that the job is not a surprise, but it is a reality that, that you're prepared for. That's right. And, and my simple advice, especially for those campuses in urban areas, is reach out to the specific big employers in your area. Uh, State Farm has recently opened a regional headquarters in Metro Atlanta, 10,000 employees uh, will, will be brought in over the next couple years. And so we talked to them about what their needs were. And we've set up programming. We're actually teaching classes on the State Farm uh, campus in risk management in other areas where they need to improve the expertise uh, of their employees. Similar with UPS. UPS is opening uh, one of its largest national uh, 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 distribution centers in the Atlanta area. They need 150 managers every six months to staff this facility, which is, uh, I was told, it takes, it's four miles to walk around the whole, uh, 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 the whole facility. And so we're working with them on saying, okay, well, how can we help? What kind of uh, skills do you need? We're even setting up buses that take our students directly to uh, this location and back again from the Georgia State campus. It's those kind of partnerships that I think are the future of the these The challenge is to do that with small and mid-sized firms, too, because we yeah. know that many people have an entrepreneurial spirit. They'd like to work in a small and mid-sized firm. Most of the job creation actually is coming there many times, and so it's much more difficult. We've had, we've had a lot of luck with the, the large employers, too, but we're really trying to intentionally reach to small and mid-sized firms in Indiana. That's right. You know, we talk a lot about uh, the game changers centered around academic maps and proactive advising, along with meta majors, right? And as we think about that, um, a lot of the conversations happening among our, our, our fellows group over the last year has also been around uh, providing opportunities for students that are fully engaged in the workforce already, 
um, with stackable credential milestones, right? And so we, we can prepare a student for the workforce directly, give them some sort of a small term or short term finish line where they off ramp into industry again, and then they come back on an on ramp style, earn a little more, a little stackable credential right into that, and then it's sort of this, this ebb and flow. So um, also really unique conversations. So uh, this idea around college completion and workforce business and industry is certainly a hot topic for us and certainly one that we'll continue to have for the years to come. I'd like to transition over here for just a moment and talk about something that has been coming up in our work for a decade. And this is around college completion, student success strategies with a lens on equity. Uh, both Elena and Herman, I would like for you to kind of share your thoughts on how we need to be laser focused, not only in moving the needle, but, but doing so with equity in mind. Elena, you want to start? Sure. I think one of the first things that you have to do is take a close look at your data um, and become familiar with it. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in a state where Massachusetts is transitioning the conversation from not just focusing on attainment and increasing attainment, but doing so through an equity framework. Um, and part of that is going to be done through a brand new performance measurement system, uh, which is partially being led by Dr. Mario Delcy, who I'd like to recognize. Um, and all of the work that we're going to be doing in this state has to not only align with our performance measurement system, but our new equity strategic framework. So any policies that get brought before the board, any initiatives that are developed internally by department staff or that are being promoted by the institutions need to have a focus on equity and not only increasing completion rates, but how are we going to close the gap for our students from traditionally underserved backgrounds um, who have been marginalized and aren't being successful when they come to our campuses. So I think data plays a really important role in that, as well as being able to have conversations that sometimes may feel uncomfortable. Um, but if you don't have those conversations and come in with that intentionality, then you're not just going to get there. And I would say the second piece is that equity looks different for every state. Um, so making sure that you're defining it in a way that makes sense for your local context is really important. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. Um, not forgetting that context, right? We throw around the word equity as if it means the same thing and it's synonymous for all of us in each of our regions, but certainly we serve different kinds of students mm -hmm. uh, with different missions in each of our institutions. So, so thank you for that perspective. How about in Georgia, the idea of moving the needle with an equity lens? So one of the things that, that uh, we need to do, for example, I, I will take the, the perspective of, of mathematics education. Uh, we know that, I mean, we, we saw it today, we have seen it uh, throughout the years, that uh, mathematics education, the challenges that we face impact underrepresented students to a greater extent. And it impacts them to a point that uh, when mathematics education should be an asset in everyone's education, it ends up becoming a barrier for these students. So, so this is just a call for everyone, just to make sure that uh, we cannot allow mathematics to be a barrier to education. First of all, it cannot be a barrier by design simply because, because of the structures that we have in place. It cannot be a barrier by principle because we still have large institutions that use mathematics as a mechanism to sift higher achieving students and where in many cases we hold back students that could be successful professionals in their field all because of content that is not even applicable or relevant. And finally, we cannot allow mathematics to be a barrier simply by omission. Even under the overwhelming amount of evidence that we have that the traditional remediation structure doesn't work, well, we need to just commit to it, bring all these changes that we know are working well, we need to bring them to scale. So just uh, move forward. I mean, uh, many, many of the states have, have done great, great work. Sometimes it requires a little bit of, of additional pressure from the top, as we heard it today. But uh, it is just our commitment to making sure that mathematics is not a barrier. I appreciate that perspective, also very focused in on the math conversation. We've seen our disaggregated data in this mm -hmm. regard, and I appreciate you continuing that conversation with, with each of the fellows this, this year. I think, turn, yeah. I think it's important to also talk about, um, if equity is important, and we all agree that it is, then you have to look at how we fund our programs and our, and our right. schools and, and paying for what we value. So for those of us who have performance funding formulas in our states, it's important that we include something that addresses the equity issue for at-risk students, that you are rewarding the completion of at-risk students in your, in your formulas. If you have need-based programs for financial aid, 
which we certainly do in Indiana. It's right. important that that is very focused and that makes sure that at a time we're telling people that education beyond high school is more important than ever, that they can afford it. So you can't um, separate this discussion of equity from this discussion of funding. Mm -hmm. That's right. Tim, you, you travel the country on this conversation as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, my advice is do, let's do a much better job at identifying the sources of inequity, where those discrepancies begin to emerge, because it's pretty insidious, in some cases uh, rather subtle, where these gaps begin to form. Uh, as recently as 2015, you know, Georgia State, there, were no, there was 19 percent of our confirmed freshmen who were not showing up for the first day of fall classes. These are not admitted students. These are students who were admitted and then confirmed their plan to attend. And so we did an analysis, a data analysis, of who these students were and where they ended up. And we found using National Student Clearinghouse, 12 months later, there are almost 300 students who were fully prepared and admitted and registered for the first day of classes at Georgia State who hadn't attended a single day of post-secondary work anywhere across the United States. And when we looked at the makeup of those students, about 90% of the students were either first generation, low income, or from underrepresented minorities. So there you have the beginnings of the equity gaps occurring before the students have even set foot for the first time in their first college level class. So we need a better job, uh, do a better job of understanding those sources before we can do a better job of addressing uh, the issues. Yeah. Can I piggyback off of just something Tim said about understanding the source um, and, and tying it back to data? One of the things that I think is important is looking, if you're going to use the equity lens, taking a thorough analysis at the policies that you have in place um, at the state level in my case. And one of the things that I was interested in were what type of institutions our students were accessing. And so our admission standards in Massachusetts are aligned with the um, not prescribed but suggested curriculum called Mass Core for K through 12 high schools. And what I realized were, was that 82% of our white students were completing Mass Core and therefore had basically automatic admission or were eligible to admission to state universities. But when you disaggregated the data and saw the students that would even be eligible for admission to state universities and University of Massachusetts campuses, the rates for Latino students and students of color in general, including African Americans, were much lower. So making sure that we're having that conversation with K through 12 of how do we make sure that these students from underrepresented backgrounds can even access any of our institutions, I think, is really important if you're talking about identifying inequities. Yeah, yeah. These are these are certainly challenging conversations. There, there it takes courageous leadership in conversation, and I'm I'm pleased that the fellows have agreed to to tackle this one uh, uh, continually, uh, year over year. I want to switch gears a little bit. You know, this this, this morning we got a little bit of a, a reminder on the newest game changer for CCA, right? Uh, the better deal for returning adults, and we know that if we're going to move the needle on college completion in this country and meet our big goals as a, as a nation that we have also got to remember we've got a population of adults out there with some college and what? No degree, right? And so uh, this, the CCA fellows have taken on this charge in, in short order to uh, lead and engage in conversations uh, related to this. I want to turn to Tim. How can CCA advance and improve the better deal for returning adults? And, and maybe thinking about it in terms of scale. How do we reach scale if we're going to hit another million or so graduates in the next couple of years? Yeah, it, it, it's a daunting challenge. And you know, the adult population is particularly complex to work with because they have more complicated lives on average than your, your average 17 or 18 year old. You know, we, we had a huge set of uh, stopout students at Georgia State, about 70,000 students over the last decade. And we wanted some systematic way to invite them back in. But it's not as simple as just sending an email or a you know, snail mail note and saying, come back to Georgia State. What we did is really case management of each one of those instances. You know, we took a look at what were the obstacles as near as we could tell to what was preventing that uh, individual from continuing at Georgia State in the first place or coming back if they've made any effort to do so. In some cases, there are institutional holds on these, on, on these students' accounts. In some cases, there are financial issues. Some of these individuals are in collections because they haven't paid back loans if they were in college in the past and so forth. We need to be intentional about 
working with the students in all those complexities because the students themselves have so much inertia to stay out of post-secondary. They have children and compli jobs and complicated lives. We're going to have to make it much easier. So what we did is we set up, in effect, a triage team. It has representatives from our registrar's office, from our admissions office, from our financial aid office, from our bursars or student account office, so that they can work together with any student who comes forward, and instead of bouncing them around to four or five different offices, say, here's what we can do to try to make this transition as easy as possible. Even so, it's steep climbing to get some of these students back in the pipeline. You know, they left for a reason, right? Yeah, Something exactly. triggered them to leave, and if, if we don't communicate with our returning adults, or our potential returning adults, that maybe things are a little different now on our campus, and maybe there are some additional wraparound targeted services that we provide these populations of, of, of returning students. Um, maybe that will trigger something else, a new experience for them, exactly what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah, and I'll mention one example there. As, as some people know, Georgia State got early on in the, the process of launching a chatbot, an AI-enhanced texting platform where students can uh, uh, and incoming and prospective students can text questions 24-7. What we found, which is particularly pertinent to the adult population, is the usage of our chatbot is higher at 1 a.m. than it is at 10 in the morning. You know, you imagine if you're working a job and raising a family and so forth, you don't have time to come into some office or even call at 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. You might have that time at, at 1 a.m. But how many of our states and how many of our campuses have thought about providing those resources, the ability for students to get the information they need at, at, at 12 or 1 a.m. as opposed to when it's convenient for us? A lot of structure changes, right? We can't just expect different results with the same kind of structure, particularly mm -hmm. we're talking about returning adults. And that's contextualized in so many different ways. And in the state of Indiana, I mean, you're a huge proponent of the returning, the returning adult. What's happening now? Well, I think we're all doing something with returning adults because we know we need to and it's the right thing to do. And as Tim has said, this is not a homogeneous group where we can have one strategy. So you have to have several strategies that you think are effective. At the state level where I work, we actually try to put in place the programs and policies and the branding of that that actually then becomes real at the campus level. Ivy Tech is represented here today. We have the nation's largest largest singly accredited community college system, and they are serving a lot of those returning adults. Uh, we identified, you know, there were 700,000 uh, Hoosiers who had some college but no degree, so we went after them first with a program called You Can Go Back. We found out, as you have, that some of those had not met SAP or other uh, owed money, and so we worked with the legislature to say if you've been out more than two years, uh, SAP has been forgiven and you can come back without needing to meet that again. You know, the difference between a 32-year-old and a 22-year-old is pretty apparent if they have the motivation to come back. But even with our early success with You Can Go Back, we realized that there were, you know, thousands and thousands of Hoosiers who had no quality credential at all, and so we worked with the legislature again to create what's called the Workforce Ready Grant, where we've identified about 150 high demand certificates. And we tell Hoosiers, if you come back and get a certificate in one of these areas, it will be free. We know that uh, the free, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, sort of a fiscal conservative about many things, and free is never really free. But what this means is the individual is making a commitment to come back and get a credential in an area in which we know they will get a job, mm. and it's going to be a, a better job than they had before. They will meet the needs of the employer community in Indiana, who are begging to actually have people come back in these areas. And they will begin a pathway, we think, of ongoing learning, that it will not be a just a one-time kind of thing for them. So, you know, we're focused on, you know, those who have some college and no degree, those who don't have a quality credential at all. We're focused with working with employers so that they're doing more in terms of tuition reimbursement, which they are stepping up and doing as well, uh, and investing in their workforce beyond uh, just the hiring, but the transitioning of their workforce. So I think there's this wonderful opportunity for higher education and the employer community to work together for both just-in-time learning, ongoing learning, and transitions to new jobs, which will be especially important to the adult community. That's right. So, you know, the, the fellows have organized, we've organized ourselves into sort of these three major think tank buckets, right? Workforce and college completion, 
uh, all of our student success work related to the game changers and others uh, with a, a lens on equity, first and foremost. And then, of course, this notion of returning adults, all in the favor of, obviously, increasing access, increasing completion, and doing so uh, in, in the most provocative and, and data-based ways, right? Um, so these, these have been the conversations that we've been having over the, next, over the last year, and we anticipate further conversations in these areas. Uh, but we've also shifted our thinking a little bit more uh, and gotten a little bit uh, deeper into a another bridge into higher education, not being the returning adult per se, but that bridge between secondary and post-secondary uh, college access, right? And I know states and regions have been talking about this, legislatures have been talking about uh, programs like dual and concurrent enrollment. Uh, programs like College Promise and the campaigns associated uh, with those sorts of conversations. And so although our, our conversations in this space of se uh, secondary to post-secondary are, 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 are pretty infant, uh, I, wanna, I wanna give our Alliance family here just an overview of, of what we've kind of been focusing in on that. So let's start with dual and concurrent enrollment, right? A hot topic nationally, uh, a topic that we can all sort of roll our sleeves up and say, oh my gosh, this has the potential to really help us get you know, high school kids on the right path to knowing that A, college is accessible, college can be affordable, and college can be completable. Mm -hmm. And we can do that at the age of 16, that's pretty neat. But there's some caveats to this, right? How do we ensure that the dual enrollment uh, programming is deployed with, with the same quality and rigor that we would expect uh, of our students that are uh, you know, post high school? So in that regard, uh, let's, start with, uh, let's start with Herman. So as you said, yes, it is a hot topic. Yeah, it, it is. It is a hot topic not only because the benefits are completely apparent. I mean, we, we're, we're jump-starting the education for all the post-secondary education for these students when they're, when they're in high school. It is, it is a great program uh, for, the, for the states that are pushing this really hard. In Georgia, we have a really, really strong dual enrollment program. And as you said, well, the only thing that we need to make sure we do is that we're very careful to make sure that we are preserving the integrity of the content and that we're careful to preserve also the integrity in the way that this content is being delivered. And so I'll, I'll just give you a, a very concrete example. I mean, when we have a dual enrollment course that is offered at a, at a post-secondary institution, if it is offered at the college campus, we have a few dual enrollment students participating in this course, those students are receiving a pretty good collegiate experience. Now what happens if uh, for some reason, let's say that we're trying to be more accommodating and we're just uh, realigning a particular course just to make sure that it satisfies or, or aligns well with, with the schedule for a particular high school. What happens, we start having maybe an over-representation of those high school students in this course. Now we're starting to impact just the diversity of thought that you will have in such a course. Now, does that mean that uh, we should, shouldn't do this? Well, not really, but we just need to be very careful because depending on the discipline, this under-representation, this, this, this lesson of, of the variety of thought may have an impact on the way that, that, that discipline wants to deliver that course. And, and, and this is just one little step of, let's say, separation from what a traditional course will look like. But we can take it one uh, uh, step forward. What if... Uh, Maybe because of problems with transportation, students cannot come to campus, right? That happens all the time. Should we just simply bring a faculty member to the high school? Maybe use teachers in the high school, as long as they are properly credentialed, to teach that course at the high school. The further we are separating this from the collegiate experience, the more careful we have to be to make sure that we are preserving the integrity of the content. Again, that's not to say that we shouldn't do that, but we just have to be really careful to make sure that the students, if we do these things, are still receiving a collegiate experience. That's right. Elena, how about for you in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, we, I would say, have two tiers of dual enrollment. One is um, just your regular concurrent and dual enrollment. Um, and those funds are provided from the department to institutions that apply for those dollars. Um, and, and recently we actually saw an increase in that line item, so that was great. It was doubled and we're better to able support our institutions that are um, participating in this work. And one of the things that I think we do that's, that's really important, that's a caveat, is that work or those courses that are offered to our students taking advantage of dual enrollment need to either satisfy one of our general education requirements or be a part of a statewide transfer pathway. 
Um, and then the second tier of our work in this space um, was led by Christine Williams, who's here today, and it's our early college coursework. And this is where we, we really partnered um, in a really intentional and thoughtful way with our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so our early college programs have five guiding principles that really lead that work, um, which make sure that we answer the questions that you were talking about, academic rigor. They also require really deep partnerships between K through 12 and higher education to make sure that the experiences that these students are getting are not only rigorous, but are showing students who may not have been um, thinking that they would go to college, it would expose them to that experience and that it would show them that they would be successful. Um, and all of that is towards an eye with equity um, because we do have an equitable access principle that's a part of that. And so as part of our early college programming, um, partnerships apply to the state for an early college designation. Um, and if they get designated, then students are provided the opportunity to earn 12 college credits before graduating from high school. Again, those credits should be aligned with one of our statewide transfer pathways, or they should satisfy a Gen Ed Foundation. We also really encourage institutions um, that are a part of this work to offer college level English and mathematics to students that are in high school. Um, and the other piece that I think is really important, um, which you touched on in, in introducing this section, is the affordability component of earning 12 college credits before you've ever set foot onto a college campus. Um, I think that's a really big deal for a lot of our students, especially our low income students and students from minoritized backgrounds. Um, if they can graduate high school with 12 credits, not only do they know that they can do this work and they've been successful, but they, they've saved themselves quite a bit of money on their post-secondary journey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we're talking a lot uh, over the next year and two and three probably and relying on our Alliance family to contribute to this conversation related to you know, perhaps what the CCA stance might be. Uh, in this regard, regarding the secondary to post-secondary transitions. And, and we've heard a lot today, yesterday, for the last several years uh, with another access point into college, particularly for students uh, right out of high school, and that's the College Promise campaign, right? We heard some great conversation related to Tennessee today, and Chrissy and, and Martha, of course, and, and others have been really out there, out in front of this. Um, as we have looked at this conversation from a fellow standpoint, we're also having it in the specific context of equity, and in the specific context of equal access, right? Uh, from, from a college promise standpoint, and you got some great things cooking in Indiana along college promise. What's happening? Well, we've been committed to the idea of making a promise to students for nearly three decades, uh, actually, and Stan Jones was key in leading the creation of the 21st Century Scholars Program. And this is our promise we make to students if uh, they sign up in seventh and eighth grade and they uh, meet certain uh, requirements, none of which are uh, really high standards in terms of impossible impossibilities for them, but if they do certain things, we tell them that we will pay for them to go to college at a, at a, a, a public school or a private school as well, that it's a tiered amount of money. So for those who are in high school going to college, we have a promise that we can make that if you're a low income, most low income and first generation primarily, there is a way to go to college. The Workforce Ready Grant that I mentioned is a promise program that we make to adults who come back that they can get a a, a promise that they can get a certificate that's paid for. Then we have in Indianapolis, it was mentioned, I think Blake may have mentioned earlier, we have a new program called India Achieves, which actually is another promise program that's done at a local level. We have a program called in Wabash County, which is builds on the 529 plan. I mention all four of these because I think they show that promise programs look, they look different in different states. It's, it's contextual again. Um, but all of them are really focused on uh, the concept that we are sending a message to uh, the people in our state that we know that education beyond high school is important and we are going to make it possible for you to access that and do it in an affordable way. Um, we're watching very closely all these promise programs to see how they're working and by all of our measures uh, they are succeeding and our 21st century scholars are succeeding at a higher level than their low-income peers. They're actually 21st century scholars, 82% are accessing college. So that's much higher than the population at large. Um, so their persistence, all of our metrics are good. So I think if you're gonna make a promise, then you need to make good on that promise mm -hmm. and then you need to follow and see how it works and make sure that it is. And we're very encouraged about what's happening in Indiana with Promise programs. Yeah, that's great. You know, we got a lot of states in our alliance and a lot of regions within our states um, that are having these conversations that have deployed, just like Indiana, very successful Promise uh, programs. And one thing I've really noticed about this conversation is 
As an alliance, we have a lot of conversations together about what's working in this state, and what can we steal from that state, how can we put this state together. Uh, so that's, that's, that's been a really fortunate conversation for us. Another area that we've been talking a lot about is this notion of culture change. Uh, this is hard work. This takes a lot of courageous leadership. And oftentimes, when we go back to our institutions, in fact, I was just reminiscing with my, with my colleagues in Nevada um, earlier this morning about this idea that I get so charged up when we get together at these annual CCA convenings, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, just be among like-minded folks who are not afraid of the data conversations, mm -hmm. who are willing to sort of grab the bull by the horns. And then we get back to our institutions and sometimes realize that there are people who don't think the same way that we do. And perhaps there's a little digging of the heels uh, going on. And so, Tim, I want to start with you on this topic of, you know, how do we move a culture from the, the standpoint of change management? You're doing a lot of innovative things, and you've, you've certainly, certainly shaken the ant farm up in, in, in Georgia State. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, 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 often, we often get attention, especially in the, in the press, for the shiny object. You know, you, you've got the new chatbot, you've got the predictive analytics, and that's what the attention I is placed upon. And I think for any one of those changes that has proven impactful and made a difference in the lives of our students, 90% of the effort is culture change mm -hmm. and changing processes and changing behavior of faculty and staff. And 10% is implementing whatever the new technological uh, innovation is. And you know, I think we need to be much more intentional about how we communicate uh, about these changes and how we justify them to what is often a very suspicious group of, uh, of stakeholders. This is one way in which uh, Complete College America has been an ally to Georgia State in our efforts over the last decade because you know, there, there's very little that links faculty together on any given campus. You know, at Georgia State, we've got business faculty and we've got fine arts faculty, and they don't see eye to eye on very many things. But most of the faculty have gone through training in graduate school to respect evidence. And if we can be proactive about providing the evidence to uh, our stakeholders by showing them the difference it makes, not only in the lives of students, not only in outcomes, but also in the ROI of a campus, mm -hmm. you know, the, the revenues that can be generated by holding on uh, to more students, we open up the conversation and we make it much more realistic uh, uh, in order to enact some, some of these changes. So I go back to my campus, I spend a lot of time meeting with departments, meeting with the faculty, with uh, chairs, council, and so forth, to try to explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and being very intentional about collecting results. When we launched the chatbot I referred to a minute ago, we made an intentional effort. We um, uh, came up with an agreement for a major national educational researcher, Lindsay Page, out of uh, uh, the University of Pittsburgh, to run a random control trial of that first three-month trial so that I knew I could go back six months later and go to our faculty and say, here are the results, and they've been uh, verified by a third party. When there's not enough of that going on, and I think that's a critical part mm -hmm. of culture change, and I think it's a critical role that Complete College America plays nationally. No doubt, and relying on the alliance, relying on the CCA group of, of leaders uh, to, have, to help along these lines, right? Mm -hmm. to, it, it, I, I often use the phrase, it's tough to be a prophet in your own land, mm -hmm. right? So we can set the stage, we can plant the seeds, we can water the seeds, but then we can rely on each other uh, to also help bring that conversation along. Well, we've got just a couple of more minutes uh, in our time together, at least at this moment. Um, I want to turn over here and, and have each of you respond to this question. You know, obviously we've collected ourselves and organized ourselves around the areas that we've talked about today, but, but you've got your ear on the ground nationally on perhaps what the future holds for, for this game-changing work. What do you suppose might be an area uh, that CCA may look at as a future game-changer, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps in five years? Herman? So I really, I really want to take this as an opportunity to, to just make a, an additional call to all the states. And it is that we need to take a look, a very hard look, at the rising cost of textbooks. And we need to make sure that we broadly adopt open educational resources. In the state of Georgia, through the Affordable Learning Georgia program, we have, we're saving every year $18 million in textbook costs to the students. And that's something that can be replicated throughout different states. So that's just another call to you. We, we're doing a lot of great things uh, through all the work through CCA, but this could, be, this could be our next one. Yeah, it's great, OERs. How about for you, Lena? 
Um, so I appreciate all of the existing game changers, and I agree with something Teresa um, and Tim have said earlier about needing to evaluate the work that we've done um, in order to, to make sure that it's moving in the right direction. And I'm not sure we need a new game changer, but I, I, one of the things that I'm interested in looking at, and I appreciate the momentum pathway and the concept behind that, is how do we integrate what we already have so that students are receiving the optimum benefits from all of the good work that we've done. If you pair up, for example, the early college work with the momentum pathway and our promise program so that students are already doing, they've earned these 12 credits, they're coming in, they have a guided pathway, they've signed up for 15 credits, they're, they don't need remediation, um, they're taking the appropriate math for their major. How are we integrating all of this work so that it's not siloed and that our students really are benefiting from our work? I think that's where we need to go next rather than treating these as isolated mm -hmm. issues. That's right, and that probably helps also with the culture change, right? The next si shiny object is no longer a shiny object, but perhaps it's they're all intermingled with mm -hmm. all the same spokes in the same wheel. That's a great, that's a great thought. Teresa, what do you think? Next area for focus. Well, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, those of us in the room have embraced the game changers and believe they're making a difference in our state. And so we're building off of a very strong legacy of work that CCA has done. I suppose the thing that informs my thinking a lot about the future, and I'm not sure where CCA fits into this, is thinking, as we all are reading about, is the changing nature of the world of work and what we're preparing people to do and how we are going to be doing that over the course of their lives. And so I understand a lot of our game changers now are focused on the immediate success of the individuals we're serving. But we need to do that with an eye to the future. And this allows us to, again, work with the employers and work with policymakers. But what's our obligation to help people transition to new places of meaningful employment as the economies change in our states? And that's going to happen. And I would welcome the help from CCA. Yeah, terrific. Tim? Well, I'm going to mention a buzzword we haven't mentioned yet on this panel this afternoon, or maybe at this whole convening so far, AI. I mean, I do think that one of the next game changers is going to be the impact of artificial intelligence. And it's going to have, I think, a very positive effect on the mission of Complete College America, because I think it's going to disproportionately benefit our low-income and underserved students. I mean, the example I've been alluded to on this panel already of our launch of the chatbot three years ago to deal with summer melt. Uh, put in the hands of all of our students a tool which they could have 24-7 to ask any question and get immediate response. When we launched the chatbot in the summer of 2016, just for our incoming freshman class, we thought we'd have five or 6,000 questions answered in the three months leading up to the start of classes. We had over 200,000 questions answered. Average response time was seven seconds. So students who are struggling with the FAFSA, students who are struggling with figuring out the choice of major and courses and so forth, were able 24 to get some support in their hands and get it in a reliable and an efficient fashion. And what's happened in three years since we launched that chatbot is we've reduced summer melt at Georgia State by 37%, meaning that we have about three to 400 additional students, mostly low income, mostly first generation, that are in their seats ready to go for classes who a year before were sitting out the whole college experience. I think it's particularly promising as a tool for the states to think about because some of this work we can do as collaboratives. You know, we, a lot of the effort in our, our chatbot was building up a knowledge base of over 2,000 answers to commonly asked questions. Well, why can't the whole state get together mm -hmm. and work on that knowledge base and launch a chatbot for all the students across the state? I think this is a wave, and I think it will be a game changer in the coming uh, five to 10 years. Yeah, it certainly has been fun to take off the crystal ball and, and look toward the future of all of our, our work around completion and equity. Um, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the fact that we are lucky enough to be able to represent the Collective Fellows voice uh, nationally. If, if, if you are a fellow among us here today, would you just stand and be recognized? We're our CCA Fellows. Thank you for your commitment to this work. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share uh, our collective voice in these conversations that we have had and will continue to have. Let's give a big round of applause to all, all of our fellows on the stage today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.